while we're waiting for everyone to just come in, uh, we're gonna play like this sh short video about um, SJC. Have like a couple of people just coming in uh, and just like yesterday uh, we actually would like to just ask um, so yeah welcome everyone again uh, we just want to ask quickly ask everyone to pro ask to answer uh, some poll questions with us just like fun stuff so uh, we have a lot of people coming from different parts of the Philippines different islands uh, as well as different um, regions actually all over the world, I heard. So we have uh, this uh, poll question that you can answer at pollev.com backslash H973. Uh, the link is actually on the chat. So if you open your chat, you can see the link uh, where you can answer which part of the world you are joining us from right now. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to uh, send us your questions or ideas uh, at slides.app.google uh, backslash 4CJXS. So you can also see that uh, on the screen as well, as well as on the chat. So you can click that link and submit your questions there. So as you can see in our screens, we have a lot of people from all over uh, the Philippines. Uh, I can see some uh, cities in the Philippines right now. Oh, uh, I think. Yeah. So as you can see in our screen, you can see just different people from all over the world right now. Uh, and if you're just coming in again, uh, you can click on the link in the chat uh, uh, and answer where you are from in the world right now, where you're joining us from uh, at pollev.com backslash H973. Uh, and we're also going to just be waiting uh, just another like five minutes uh, for those who are still coming in. So while you're waiting, please feel free to share our to uh, to answer the question of where you're from at pollev.com. Uh, and you could also share our live stream. So we'll be sharing. Uh, We'll be sharing the link to you for the live stream as well.
So we have a couple more minutes and we're seeing just a lot of people from everywhere right now. Uh, we ha actually have some people joining us outside of the Philippines. Uh, wow, it's changing again. So I'm reading uh, Spain uh, and we also have Korea and New Zealand. Um, I think we also have some people from Japan and Singapore. So once again, if you haven't entered the poll, you may answer it at pollev.com backslash HQ973. The link is on the chat. Okay, so uh, we are going to be starting soon. So if you're just coming in, feel free to still answer where you're from in the poll. And you may also just um, send us any questions you may have at slides.app.google4cjxs or see our live stream or share about our live stream uh, in the YouTube link on the chat. Yep, so just uh, also want to say thank you to everyone who came to our uh, for to the first day of our webinar yesterday. Uh, we actually had like participants from all over the Philippines and also from outside of the Philippines around Asia. Uh, there were, I think, around 90 participants yesterday. So we just want to thank everyone who were there and everyone who are also um, here right now. Uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, SJC, uh, about uh, the different events that SJC does uh, internationally, regionally in Asia, as well as our plans for the Philippines in the upcoming year. Uh, we also had a couple of questions about partnerships, and uh, we have sent you a Google form, but later on, you will also see that uh, form again, as well as our email. So if you ever have like questions later on about SJC and how you could be involved in making space for the Philippines or uh, in Asia or even like um, globally, you may be able to do that later. So uh, we also uh, join. We also have a couple of other people who are who have been organizing and uh, will be co-hosting this webinar with me today. So uh, I am Florence. I am currently the national point of contact in the Philippines together with Harley. So Harley and Bernadette and Christine can also come in and introduce themselves. All right, maybe we can start. I can start. So my name is Harley Kizagan and I'm the co-national point of contact for the Philippines for Space Generation Advisory Council. So currently I am doing works on uh, like commercial space uh, for emerging space nations. Uh, and that's why I'm very, I'm very active in volunteer programs with SGAC. So I'll give the floor to Bernadette. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Bernadette. I am currently uh, based in Japan right now, uh, pursuing my graduate studies in systems engineering. And I am uh, the regional coordinator for the Asia Pacific region of SGAC. And uh, I was previously the national point of contact of SGAC as well. With that, I turn over to Christine. Uh, thank you. So again, if you were uh, there yesterday, so I'm Christine Jane Atienza. I'm one of the of the executive secretary of SJC. I am based in the Philippines. I am not uh, I am not professionally part of the space 
sector. I'm professionally a nutritionist, dietitian, dietitian uh, practicing humanitarian uh, work in here in the Philippines. But I'm very, very passionate about space. So, so there, I am giving the floor back to our mo moderators for today. So for today, uh, me and Bernadette will be um, supporting the, the back end. So feel free to ask questions or ch chat us if you have any other concerns. Thank you, Christine, Bernadette, and Harley. So uh, today, uh, Harley and I, the National Points of Contacts for the Philippines, will be moderating uh, the panel discussion. So we're going to be starting off um, uh, by introducing our uh, speakers for today. We are very honored uh, to have with us Dr. Joel Joseph S. Marciano, Jr., the current Director General of Philippine Space Agency, um, and Nicholas Buraz, the founder of Rotoiti, uh, to share with us about like space in the Philippines as well as in the Asia Pacific region. So Harley will be. Uh, so before all of that as well, we just want to give a couple of house rules. Um, we uh, would like everyone to give their full attention, and if you have any questions, um, there will be a time allotted for questions later on. Uh, during the panel discussion, as well as a Q&A session. So you may again send your questions at slides.app.google backslash 4CJXS. We are also sending the link to that in the chat. So you can go to the chat and click on that link. Uh, the presentation will be mostly in English as well as some Filipino because most of our audience today are from the Philippines. Uh, and if you ever would like to share about our event today in social media, you, you can use our official hashtags, hashtag space for PH and hashtag SKC. And for networking opportunities, you can stay at the end of the session. Uh, so yeah, to start off, uh, we'll uh, also today are the topics for the panel discussion are the history of the Philippines, of space in the Philippines. Uh, and then we'll have career opportunities uh, in the Philippines, in the space industry, and outlooks for the Asia Pacific region's space industry. And uh, Harley will be introducing our first speaker for today. So. All right. So since we have two very amazing speakers today, we can start right away with our first speaker. So Dr. Joel Joseph S. Marciano Jr. is a professor of electrical and electronics engineering from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And in January 2020, he was appointed as the first director general of the Philippine Space Agency, otherwise known as FILSA. Uh, so he is now leading the buildup and mobilization of the newly created National Government Agency. Um, prior to Filsa, he was also the program leader of the Philippine Microsat or Phil Microsat and Stamina for Space programs from 2014 to 2020. He was also leading a diverse team in the development and utilization of the country's first scientific Earth observation satellite microsatellites, the Diwata 1, the Diwata 2, and the nanosatellite Maya 1, and at least 10 more small satellites in various stages of development. So with that, uh, let's all welcome Dr. Joel Joseph Marciano, the Director General of the Philippine Space Agency, for his short presentation. Hello, thank you, Harley. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Florence, Bernadette, and Christine. Pleasure to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yep, we can hear you well. Okay, so let me, let me share my screen now and get started on this presentation. All right. Um, so... Hope everybody's having a nice weekend wherever you might be in the world and are you staying safe and, um, and um, staying healthy. Okay, now, let me uh, share with you a little bit about the Philippine Space Agency and our activities in space science, technology, and applications. So I'll call this presentation Our Place in Space uh, Value Creation in Space with Data, Industry, and People. But, um, so, a little more than a year ago, the Philippine Space Act or Republic Act 11363 was enacted uh, with the president assigning it into law. And it's an act establishing the Philippine Space Development and Utilization Policy and creating the Philippine Space Agency and for other purposes. So in that um, piece of um, legislation, um, it stipulates the mandate of the Philippine Space Agency as the primary policy planning, coordinating, implementing an administrative entity of the executive branch of government 
for implementing the National Space Program in line with the Philippine space policy. So alongside that mandate were uh, six key development areas that were identified. These are national security and development, hazard management and climate studies, space research and development, space industry capacity building, which I believe we'll be talking about as well today, education and awareness and international cooperation. The FILSA, which is the abbreviation for the Philippine Space Agency, not PSA, because PSA, we already have that, that's the Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, FILSA is under the office of the president and guiding FILSA is a Philippine Space Council. This Philippine Space Council is a very high level group shared by the president himself or herself you know, in the future. Um, and the vice chairs are the secretary or the heads of the Department of National Defense and the Department of Science and Technology. The other members are heads of various other departments of the cabinet of the president, as you can see their logos there. Uh, from the finance department, uh, information communications technology, agriculture, environment and natural resources, national economic and development authority, um, trade and industry, foreign affairs. Also the uh, chairs of the science and technology committee of the um, upper and lower house, the Senate and the House of Representatives in Congress. Okay. Now, prior to the establishment of the Philippine Space Agency, there have been numerous activities um, done through the auspices of the Department of Science and Technology, DOST, and among others, this include the development of small satellites uh, for the Philippines. So Diwato-1 was uh, built um, by Filipino students who studied in Japan, and they built it together with uh, in the laboratories there in Tohoku University and Hokkaido University. It was deployed from the ISS in 2016. We expected it to last in orbit a little over 18 months, but it stayed there for about four years until it fell back into the Earth, uh, into the atmosphere in April this year. So it, it's already gone, but you know, not without um, taking many pictures. Uh, Diwata 2 is in a higher orbit, 600 kilometers, uh, deployed from a Japanese H2A rocket in October 2018, and it's still in orbit. It's our workhorse currently, uh, taking multispectral images and high precision images all over uh, the country. And uh, in between those two, we had a CubeSat, Maya One, which is really our platform for technology demonstration and for education, for proliferating um, small satellite technology to different universities in the country. You see that there, Maya One. Okay, now, um, so these are Philippine small satellites so far. Um, you know, what has happened here, the, the Philippines has been able to participate in this very exciting venture because I'd like to think that, you know, these computers, which we're all familiar with, we kind of demystify these satellites by thinking of them as really just computers, you know, in the same way that our vehicles or our cars right now are really just computers on wheels, some people say. So we're putting computers in orbit. And this computing is in itself changing, you know, it now pervades space. What's accounting for that, I guess, is the reduction in cost of very important um, parameters like the cost, uh, like bandwidth, storage, and computing. If you just look at this chart, I just point out the cost of storage, that yellow curve. In the 1970s, having one megabyte of storage cost around the order of 10,000 US dollars. Right now, one megabyte, I don't even know what I can do with one megabyte. Of course, I need one megabyte to build up a bigger file, but if you give me one megabyte, I'd say no thanks. No, right? But uh, in our pockets, we have 64 gigabyte storages that cost probably something like $10, $15. So all of that has contributed to, um, among other things, our cell phones advancing. You know, they're shrinking, but yet becoming more powerful. So computers are changing, they fit in the palm of our hands. And this uh, development in the smartphone technology and other commodity electronics have helped propel these small satellites um, so that um, they are they are now found in this different environment and hostile environment of space, and they are made to work there. So the, it's um, now technologies that are developed on Earth for commodities are now finding their way into space, and therefore reducing costs, reducing risks, perhaps, and allowing more people to participate. Okay. Well, it's not only. You see, it's not only universities and governments doing this. There's an increasing share, according to this Bryce report, of uh, industries. Um, it's becoming a more commercial venture. Even startup companies range, um, race, racing venture capital 
to um, fund satellites and constellations. Uh, among countries, I'm happy to see that the Philippines is mentioned in the report, having six or fewer government small sats. We expect that to increase uh, soon this year, despite the pandemic, we are trying to, hopefully we can deploy one of our CubeSats still, um, perhaps later this year, depending on availability of uh, rockets, but um, we, we were scheduled to deploy three this year, three CubeSats this year. So our take on this um, is on, well, there's a national government program called Build, Build, Build. It's really a job creation and infrastructure development program of the Philippine government. We've kind of adopted and adapted that and called it Build, Build, Build in Space. This is in Pilsa, one of the flagship projects. You see there, uh, Diwata 1 and Diwata 2, of course, and Maya 1 in between. Maya will be continued as a series of CubeSats. Uh, Maya 2 is being built in Kyushu uh, Institute of Technology by our scholars there. Uh, it will be, um, alongside Maya 3 and Maya 4, which are actually quite important to note, these are localized versions of Maya 1 and Maya 2. So we've taken what we've learned from there, we've brought it into our own universities, and we have enlisted our own scholars through local scholarships provided by the Philippine government within Philippine universities to now build these CubeSats. So, so we're hoping that Maya 3 and Maya 4 can be deployed uh, this year still. It will be followed by another batch, Maya 5 and 6, and then progress on to 3U and 6U CubeSats. Of course, Diwata 3 is on the horizon. Another Earth observation multispectral satellite is uh, in the planning stages and, uh, well, initial implementation stages. Then in the middle, there is Innovasar. We did not build the satellite. It's a UK satellite, but the Philippines is one of the partners in, in this uh, satellite, um, among other uh, four other countries. And of course, there's always talk about telecommunication satellites, especially with the Philippines as an archipelago and requiring connectivity to the islands and to rural places and geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. So that's always there. And um, you know, this uh, subject of discussion with the information and communications technology department. Supporting that infrastructure in space is ground infrastructure. So there are, we have built um, receiving stations in Luzon, the main island of Luzon, in Quezon City, in the roof deck of uh, the ASTI building where I was before. Uh, in Mindanao, beside the Davao International Airport, you see that in the middle. And we were supposed to inaugurate the one in the Visayas region um, earlier this year. It's operational, but we just have to do the ceremony. So inside these facilities, you see that control room and you know computers and large screens, etc., where we use uh, what, what we where we use to communicate with satellites. Another important ground infrastructure is computing because we are getting a lot of data from these satellites and we need high performance computers. So we have actually one courtesy of the Advanced Science and Technology Institute. We want to replicate this. We want to expand this across the archipelago and also democratize access to high performance computing to support scientific research and operational requirements. So this is currently it's a modest high performance computer. It's inside a shipping container that's 24 seven air conditioned and located behind the past building. So when we build these satellites and we build this ground infrastructure, when we mobilize these satellites, what we're actually doing is mobilizing data. And an example of this typically is when you're preparing for typhoons, which we face every year. You know, the mobilization means before the typhoon comes, you try to see from your archive um, images, how much of what are the images you have over the past areas that are going to be affected by this typhoon. So you have three typhoon images. And then when the typhoon passes, you take images again, you have post typhoon um, images and you do the change detection between before and after the event. And among other things, it can yield things like a flood map, a probable flood map. You see that in blue, a streaks of blue there in the image area. And this is being issued automatically to various government agencies. Okay, so our satellites have target pointing capability. So even though we're not passing directly over, overhead, we can target it for certain uh, accuracy. And all of this data has been used by various government agencies in the Philippines, and we hope to further expand this and increase their utilization. Okay. Examples of this data mobilization. We have been um, employing so-called machine learning techniques on these satellite images to do an inventory of roads, to detect the roads, uh, newly constructed roads or existing roads, also coconut trees, mango trees, it's all in the realm of object detection. The training computers to identify these objects in a satellite image and letting them do, the, do this uh, in subsequent images in an unsupervised way. 
So these uh, things can be overlaid onto other maps, you know, like uh, a flood map, so you can more intelligently assess the extent of damage to infrastructure or agriculture when a typhoon passes. Other things we're looking at satellite images, an inventory of aquaculture um, and fisheries. So see here in the image here, you see fish ponds, fish cages, fish traps, fish pens. Fish ponds are on land, they're the yellow ones. The others are in, in the water. See green ones are fish pens, fish traps, fish cages. So we're doing this for the Philippine Statistics Authority because they're doing a census on agriculture and fisheries. And they have come to realize that, well, you know, we can use satellite images for this. And so they've hooked up with the DOST, ASTI, and PILSA to enable this um, very uh, important application. Now, um, but by, by being able to detect objects, you can train computers to detect building footprints, which is what we used here when there was a landslide, uh, unfortunately, in Cebu a couple of years back. Once we heard the news, we, took, we had an archive of the area. We detected the houses. You see there in the image on the left and try to delineate the initial extent of the landslide. The important thing here is to get this information out to emergency responders at the soonest possible time, because uh, the people's lives depend on it, because they are trapped under rubble. You want to enable the responders to have intelligent information on where to try to look for survivors first. And when we finally managed to get an image courtesy of the Dove constellation of Planet Labs of the actual landslide area, we found that our est initial estimate was pretty close to the actual event, uh, the actual landslide extent. So we also gave this out immediately to the emergency responders for them to use. And subsequently people on Facebook and the field started posting these pictures. We, we got them and we saw that we were very gratified that they, they used these images and to try to save lives. So there's nothing of course more gratifying to a scientist than seeing their outputs being used in the real world um, for such a purpose, right? You see their emergency responders in the rubble using pointing to our maps, using GPS devices to find out where they are relative to the map, et cetera. Um, in the, we've, we've also been tracking uh, various infrastructure during this pandemic, um, the docking of ships in Manila Bay um, because of the ships repatriating Filipinos who work on these cruise ships. So they, we saw the increase in the number of ships in Manila Bay. Uh, we also monitored traffic, air quality levels, um, water quality levels, etc. And uh, so that's that's there's a, there's a website here, space.gov.ph slash space data. You can check it out. Now we've also been using night lights, among other things, to um, correlate with household expenditure on the provincial level in the Philippines. So to support or maybe supplant the census, you can use night lights as a proxy indicator for. Uh, for household expenditure on the provincial and regional level in the Philippines. So it's pretty good correlation here. And one more thing here, um, Super Typhoon Haiyan, we locally we call it Yolanda, hit Pakloban in 2013. So when the typhoon hit, all the lights went out expectedly, but then you can see how the lights were starting to come back on along this x-axis, which is time. But every time a new typhoon comes in, we kind of we kind of set back a little bit, right? It disrupts our recovery, then we bounce back, then we're kind of disrupted again and we bounce back. So we're, we're doing this for different typhoons, for different earthquakes, et cetera, that you know, uh, unfortunately come to the Philippines and tracking the progress and I guess recovery of our efforts through um, of our communities through night lights. So it's, it's really a lot about data, you know? So later on we discuss what's in it for me when we have a space industry, you know? The, then if you're, if you're a fan of utilization of, of, of space-borne enabled data, there's plenty of room for that. But it's also about building a local space industrial base. So when we build these satellites, we have an opportunity to contribute our own devices, our own payloads, our own electronics, our own computers. You see there in the pictures are, are, are systems that we have built in our own laboratories that are now, um, that now have space heritage because they have flown in, on the water too. So an amateur radio, a, a sun aspect sensor, an at experimental attitude control system. And these are now increasingly being localized. And trying to, that means it's engaging local companies and their capabilities. And if they need to ramp up in terms of the prototyping and testing of these components, so that we can start talking to them more. 
to supply these components. Not just to us, but perhaps globally. And there are a number of local facilities that can work with PILSA and the space industry. Um, again, some of these funded, most of these funded by the Department of Science and Technology. PILSA will be working for, with them. Advanced Material Device and Materials Testing Laboratory, Admatel for um, failure analysis and materials characterization. There's an electronics product development center that houses a world-class 10 meter semi anechoic chamber for electromagnetic compatibility measurement. You see that in the bottom there of your screen, uh, pretty nice to go inside there. It's, an, it's a Faraday cage. So when you go in, there's no signal that come in, can come in from the outside world, you're pretty isolated. Okay? And of course we have our laboratories for small satellites, we call it helices. And there's an, a diamond mold solution center, which we can use to build frames uh, for CubeSats and small sats and other components. So these are all coming together now in, in the Philippines. And so that FILSA doesn't have to build everything on its own. It's taking advantage of these investments that have been there and serving other industries, serving the semiconductor electronics industries, serving uh, the universities, and they can all come together. And now we bring them to bear, uh, their, their, their capabilities are brought to bear on bringing satellites, as, uh, building satellites as infrastructure and also uh, producing data from these satellites. Okay. So now, um, then let me talk about, because this is the Space Generation Advisory Council, when we, I'd like to, this is a, a favorite topic of mine when I talk to young people. You know, when we build satellites, we also build people. In particular, I, I, I call them T-shaped people. So the T is a metaphor, you know, for the individual's uh, depth and breadth of skills. You see there in the diagram, you know, boundary crossing competencies. You might be good in one or two things, but can you branch out to other people and work with them? So that's measured by that horizontal bar, okay? So this vertical bar is your depth of related skills and expertise in a single field. The horizontal bar is your breadth of skills and the ability to collaborate across disciplines. That's very important. Now, science and technology, let me cite this example um, about clean energy. Um, okay? It's becoming increasingly collaborative. When you think about clean energy, it's not just the domain of chemistry, physics, material science, you see the other fields contributing to this area. So if you want to solve a clean energy problem, it requires the inputs and contributions of people coming from various disciplines to solve a bigger societal problem. So go ahead, by all means, solve a chemistry problem. But in order to solve a clean energy problem, you need other people, you need to work with other people. So that's what the diagram says. So that's applies, that also applies in space. It's an interdisciplinary venture. Because we, we, when we go into space, we're trying to solve complex problems and achieve a bigger societal impact. So we need T-shaped young people, T-shaped researchers and innovators that can use knowledge in multiple ways, increasingly across institutions, disciplines, and borders. So therefore, you know, people who come to our teams as electrical, electronics, or mechanical engineers, we turn them into systems engineers. The people who have background initially in remote sensing now have empathy for data science and data analytics. Okay. So when you wanna be T-shaped, where do you go? Well, our programs, um, local CubeSat development program offers that opportunity. There's a scholarship program that's available uh, at the University of the Philippines initially. So there's an, a batch of eight, you see them there in the picture, um, uh, four ladies and four gentlemen. Um, there in the picture, the initial batch, it will be followed by another batch of 10 people building uh, a couple of CubeSats hands-on and deploying them into orbit. Okay, so you have to work as a team. So now finally, um, the Philippine Space Agency is new. We've, we're not yet, well, we're a year old, but we started mobilizing around March this year. So I'd like to say that we're, while we're building from the ground up, you know, we're not necessarily starting from scratch. Um, all the work that you've seen so far is contained in a volume, in three volumes, Our Place in Space, Volume 1, 2, 3, which will be released soon. Volume 1 is about data utilization. Volume 2 is about space technology. Volume 3 is about capacity building, outreach, and sustainability. And you see the other pictures here. We are now in the process of organizing PILSA and getting the, the what they call plantilla items so we can start hiring the, the bigger teams. And so that should happen within the year. And we have submitted our report to the office of the president. You see that on the right on the status. Okay. 
So let me end by sharing this. Uh, the Filsa envisions a Filipino nation bridged, uplifted, and empowered through the peaceful uses of outer space. We will promote and sustain a robust Philippine space ecosystem that adds and creates value in space for and from Filipinos and for the world. Thank you very much for your attention. The logo that you see here is an initial logo. It's not yet the official logo, but I thought I'd share with this group something, but it's not yet official. I just thought we should put a logo here, but um, you will come up with your official logo uh, pretty soon. Thank you very much. So back to you, uh, Harley. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marciano, for that very informative uh, presentation. I'm actually from Cebu, so I got really excited when you shared something about how um, uh, the space industry in the Philippines has been, has been used and like technologies has been used for um, Cebu as well. So uh, we're going to have our second presenter, um, Nick Poros, who is the CEO of Rotuiti, and uh, Harley will be sharing his bio. Harley? Okay, I guess um, Harley might be having some technical difficulties right now. So I'll just uh, quickly introduce Nicholas. So Nicholas is the founder and CEO of Rotuiti, where he consults for clients in the space sector on a variety of business intelligence matters. He is also completing his doctoral studies, which focus on comparing different government approaches to intervening in markets. Furthermore, he manages filling space a website that features weekly interviews with space sector experts. So let's all welcome um, Nicholas, uh, who will be presenting about uh, careers and beyond in the Asia Pacific region. Welcome, Nick. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm gonna try sharing my screen here. If you could please, uh, let's see. If you could please confirm that it works. Can you see that? Yep, it works. Thank you, Nick. That's great. Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, yes, thanks very much for having me. Um, that was a very interesting presentation, Dr. Marciano. Thanks. I like the logo. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought that was really interesting. I love Earth observation, but I'd never heard of the uh, night light to household expenditure correlation use for earth observation imagery. So that's really interesting. Um, so I have as a kind of a focusing question for my presentation, what is the Asia Pacific space sector's outlook? Um, and it may be a bit of a cheat, but I'm not going to give an answer. Um, I will rather be explaining how I would go about answering uh, that question and then maybe helping people in the audience think about how to go about critically assessing space sector outlooks. Um, but before I do that, I would like to uh, let me just pin my video there. Okay. Um, I want to just give a little bit of personal background. So um, I am a, a, I used to work as a business intelligence consultant in Washington, DC. I'm American. Um, but I uh, now live in New Zealand and I'm a PhD candidate in international business at the University of Auckland. And my research looks at how different uh, governments go about supporting business internationalization. Um, I manage a website called Filling Space, which features weekly interviews with space experts. Um, and I also am an Asia Pacific space sector consultant. I have a company called Rotoiti and I have worked for various clients around the region in different uh, business areas. Right now I'm focusing a lot on um, earth observation. So uh, the question, how do you actually go about assessing Asia Pacific space sectors outlook? Well, um, I think that the only way that you can answer that is to think about how, about, about compiling what different national space sectors look like. So. Asia Pacific as a region, its space sector depends on what all the component national space sectors look like. And the Asia Pacific, um, like many regions, has a lot of countries that want to be space powers 
Um, there are many space agencies that have been set up in the last decade or so. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. It's like eight, nine, ten, um, including the Philippines, including New Zealand, where I am, including Australia. Uh, you know, I think the UAE, um, Turkey, a bunch of countries. Um, so space is very interesting right now and lots of countries want to take part in it and some of them will succeed and some will not. Um, so which countries will become space powers? I think that's the only way you can answer the question about Asia Pacific space sector outlook is to think about which countries in the Asia Pacific are going to establish themselves as space powers. And by space powers, I mean countries that have kind of uh, internationally recognized leadership and expertise in a particular area of the space sector, the global space sector. So um, how do you know if a country will become a space power? Well, in order for a country to establish its reputation as a leader in a particular area, it needs to establish its, uh, it, it needs to get um, expertise in a particular niche. Uh, you have to be the best at something, basically. Um, and there are many niches. Uh, it's oftentimes people like to focus on the headline catching activities like SpaceX rocket launches. Um, but there are many tiny little components in the overall space sector where you can specialize. So, um, you know, uh, satellites have thrusters. You could specialize in thrusters. There are multiple types of thrusters. Um, there are kind of, you know, green propellant th thrusters and other thrusters that are, you know, supposedly associated with more kind of, uh, well, they're non-green ones that have issues here on Earth. So you can focus in on something very particular. Um, there are many niche options. Uh, governments are very important uh, actors in, they're very important factors that affect market actor behavior. So if the goal is to establish a niche in a particular area, that means all the market actors need to start focusing on that area. Will the market actors focus on that area? You need to look at government policy because governments are still really important uh, factors in the space sector. Um, people like to talk about commercialization as being a very important, as a new thing happening in the space sector. People talk about SpaceX and Planet Labs as these private companies that are doing all this just pure private, uh, private sector business activity. But if you look at these big companies, they all have massive contracts with governments. Um, it's difficult to find a company in the space sector that doesn't ultimately, somewhere down the value chain, there isn't a government contract or a government, some sort of government influence is affecting behavior. Um, so in order to know if a country will successfully become a space power, you need to look at government policy. How do you know if a policy approach will succeed in making a country become a space power? Well, the first thing you need to do is identify the approach. You need to sit back and think, okay, wait a second, what is the government doing? Uh, you need to think about that first before you think about any of the implications. Um, and there are various approaches. Um, in my mind, there's kind of a spectrum of government uh, policy approaches. There's the enabling, there, there's a spectrum between enabling and steering. Enabling means basically uh, laissez-faire, uh, let the markets do what they will uh, sort of policy. Whereas steering is more statist government telling companies what they ought to be doing. Um, and they differ in terms of their ideology, their preferences and their mechanisms. So with the enabling approach, the ideology is you just, government's role is to remove barriers to doing business. The, uh, its preference, the government's preference in terms of which market actors to support is market actors that have solid business plans. Um, the, the mechanisms by which the government supports market actors is it generally is about helping those market actors refine their strategies so that they're more competitive. For the steering approach, it's very different. The ideology is, um, it's the government's role is to cultivate desired business areas and the prep the preference the government's preference about which market actors to support is are those market actors in the areas we want to develop if so yes we, we shall support them 
and the mechanism is generally financial incentives, whether direct or indirect. Um, the second thing you need to, need to do, so the first thing you need to do to understand if a policy approach will succeed is identify the approach. The second thing you need to do is identify the approach's benefits and drawbacks. So uh, each approach, and it's not just enabling and steering, I'm just using these as, this is how I conceptualize it. You can conceptualize it differently. And there are more benefits and drawbacks than those that I show here. Um, but, but you need to think about what is this approach's what are the benefits and the drawbacks associated with it? So for instance, enabling that kind of like laissez-faire approach, uh, the benefits are that you create uh, market actors that are very responsive to market signals. They're very entrepreneurial because they're competing with each other. They're resilient. They don't depend on any government policy. So if government policy changes, they'll survive. Um, whereas the steering approach, the more status kind of government guiding companies approach has different benefits. It can bring about very quick change, um, that that change can be in a particular direction. So getting a bunch of companies to do a particular sort of thing. Um, and you can get complementarity, meaning uh, you can, if the government is sort of coordinating market actor behavior, then you can get different business areas that kind of mutually benefit each other being cultivated at the same time. Um, and the drawbacks of the two approaches are essentially the converse of that. So whereas the steering approach, you get good speed, direction, and complementarity, the enabling approach, you don't have very much speed, direction, and complementarity. And whereas the enabling approach, you get lots of responsive, entrepreneurial, resilient market actors. One can argue that the steering approach, you don't get uh, responsive, entrepreneurial, resilient market actors. So the third thing you have to do after having identified what the approach is, what, how it's char characterizing the approach and then the benefits and the drawbacks is you need to assess the comparative benefits and drawbacks. And this is where you can start to say, hey, the outlook for this national space sector is whatever, whatever your analytical takeaway is. Um, so you assess the benefits and the drawbacks and then you need to think about what other countries are also aspiring to fill a similar niche. So if we, I'm just completely making this up, but if we say, you know, Thailand, if we think about what their approach is and we think about their benefits and drawbacks and we kind of make an assessment that, you know what, they have a pretty, it's not perfect, but they look like they're gonna be decent in the short term with, I don't know, developing their earth observation industry. That only matters if you look at other countries that are also trying to develop their earth observation industries. If we look at the Philippines and the Philippines, we have a better assessment, a bet, we think the Philippines has a better outlook. Well, then Thailand is not gonna have a very good outlook because the Philippines will beat it. Whereas if we think the Philippines outlook is worse than Thailand's, then Thailand's outlook will be good. Um, so ultimately the outlook that you develop depends on how you compare the benefits and drawbacks of different national space sectors trying to achieve the same thing. Um, as an example, uh, I am located in New Zealand and um, I recently uh, published uh, an, article, an article, a series of articles comparing New Zealand and Australia's space sector development. And both countries are trying to develop their launch, uh, launch services sector. So if you are into the space sector, you may have heard about Rocket Lab, which is um, one of the most successful kind of up and coming launch service providers. And uh, they launch primarily here from New Zealand. Uh, and yeah, they, they have, I think it was six or seven launches last year and more than that set for this year, I think. Australia on the other hand, uh, does not yet have um, really a launch services sector, but it is trying to. Um, so to use these two countries as an example for uh, their outlooks, depending on comparative benefits and drawbacks. If we look at New Zealand, New Zealand has more of an enabling approach, the kind of laissez-faire approach, which means they have a real good benefit of responsiveness. Rocket Lab, uh, the main launch service provider in New Zealand is providing a type of launch that is, there's a clear demand for it. It's kind of like modular, uh, quick uh, launch services. It's called the FedEx of space, um, or that's what it's aspiring towards. 
But there is a drawback of New Zealand's approach, which is that the government isn't really, doesn't really have many levers to tell Rocket Lab what to do. And Rocket Lab is technically a US company and there's lots of clients in the US. So there's nothing to stop um, Rocket Lab from in the next couple of years, just switching over to uh, launch out of the United States. And that's a serious drawback from New Zealand's perspective in terms of becoming you know, a space power uh, in terms of launch services. Australia, on the other hand, uh, it is very much an enabling country like New Zealand, but it's a bit more steering. There's a bit more statist intervention kind of trying to influence business behavior. Um, and that means that there is more of a benefit in terms of direction if Australia is successful uh, with uh, cultivating a launch services sector, those launch service providers will most likely be truly sovereign, not like Rocket Lab, which is technically an American company which could relocate to the United States whenever it wants to. Um, so that's one benefit, but there's also a drawback, which is uh, the market actors that the government is trying to influence, are they kind of losing sight of market indicators? Are they losing responsiveness to real market demand because arguably the launch uh, service, the, the launch market is already overly crowded. We already have too many launch service providers. Um, so maybe the launch service providers that emerge in Australia will not be very competitive um, because they'll be trying to break into a market where there's not much demand for them. Um, so if you think about that, then you say, okay, so those are some of the benefits and the drawbacks. Uh, they're going for the same niche. So what does that mean in terms of their outlook? You know, you can come up with many. It, it really, the sky is the limit. Your imagination is basically the limit in terms of what this means for each national space sector's outlook. But examples could be that, you know, New Zealand's launch capacity outlook looks pretty strong if Rocket Lab stays in New Zealand. If Rocket Lab stays in New Zealand is kind of an important if. Um, whereas Australia's outlook you know, it's questionable, but it definitely improves if Rocket Lab leaves New Zealand. Um, and especially if that is combined with growing regional launch demand. Uh, so if there's more people, and I don't mean demand from actors in Asia Pacific, I mean demand for launches from Asia Pacific. Um, and then there's many other implications. Final slide is, oh yeah, so act based on your outlook. So um, I'm happy to, uh, you can talk to the organizers and get my contact info if you wanna discuss this more. Um, but I really think uh, I encourage more people to think critically about uh, space sector outlooks. There's a lot of excitement about space, but there's not a lot of, Sometimes the hype, uh, there's more hype than there is critical analysis of what's happening in national space sectors. So um, for those of you in the audience that are interested in analyzing national space sector outlooks, uh, identify the national policy approach, identify the benefits and drawbacks, and then compare those benefits and drawbacks to the benefits and drawbacks of what is happening in competitor countries to determine the outlook for a national space sector. Um, and then I, I would say, once you have your outlook, it's really important to act on it. So you can either try and influence policy to improve policy if you've determined that an outlook is not ideal because of such and such policy issues. You can try to influence policy either from within a space agency or from outside it. Um, you know, there's plenty of uh, government positions that can help, can help influence space agency policy without being in a space agency. You can also adjust your own strategy. So if you're a company or, uh, or in an organization that is somehow involved in the space sector, having an awareness of an outlook can then inform you to have a better strategy to be about what you ought to be doing. Um, and then the third way that you might be able to act based on your outlook is advising and educating others. So, you know, as a journalist or an educator uh, or an author or whatever, you can be telling people um, what outlooks are so that they can behave more intelligently. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is I think the space sector needs a lot more people who are not scientists and engineers. Scientists and engineers are amazing. I mean, they are the people who make space technology work and the space sector would not exist without them. 
but a lot more than science and technology matters for the space for for humanity's engagement with space to continue there needs to be a much better understanding of political and economic factors as well uh, and i'll leave it there i guess thank you very much nick um, that was a very informative session again um, i think a lot of our audience here are probably not in the um, science industry so it's really great to hear about uh, another perspective that they could be involved in in the space industry. So to move on, we're going to be having our panel discussion over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, and uh, we'll have both of our speakers answer some questions. Uh, and in the meantime, you can also uh, scan your um, scan this QR code or click on the link where you can connect with um, SJC so we could um, help you out in terms of how you would like to be more involved in space. Um, you may also ask questions in slides.app.google backslash for CJXS, uh, which will also be in the chat. Um, and right now we're also having, during the panel discussion, we have a live um, uh, artwork, uh, I think, our artist is still coming in. So in yeah. the meantime, I'll turn it over to Harley, who will be um, moderating the first topic for the panel discussion. Um, so yeah, um, maybe what we can do is we can just give the artist a little bit of time as she uh, comes back in for the Wi-Fi because we really want to see how she does the artwork. So maybe in the meantime, can we uh, present again the the poster and the QR code so people who can would love to contact or connect with us especially people in the Philippines or outside the Philippines who want to collaborate on like projects or outreach or uh, proposal events we can always do that we'd love to connect to everyone uh, actually I was really really um, inspired by what Nick said uh, especially on the last part and which is aligned with what Dr. Marciano also said about the T-shaped people. Um, I, I remember him saying that uh, what's really challenging about the space industry is like bringing in non-space nerds into the fold. That stuck with me for quite some time. It's actually really true. Uh, I love the idea because uh, the, the space industry is like a highly collaborative, uh, you know, industry and you can't, you can't do it by just uh, doing technical stuff. You really need as many creative minds as possible. So <laughs> on that note, that's why we have an artist today with us and I hope she can, she can join us. Her Wi-Fi just went down, so let's just give her a few minutes. Uh, I think she's already accessing the link. Yeah. yeah. In the meantime, um, Harley, I, I think Carly, you can uh, introduce a few members of our audience who are, um, yeah, who you might know. So actually, it's really awesome because friends from there are friends from Singapore who, who are joining us right now. Uh, also, we have friends from Boeing who is in the audience. Um, we also have friends from Austria and SES, the Satellite Space System, and they are an audience right now. So we'd really love to acknowledge their presence. Uh, so welcome to this webinar series. And yeah, hope, hope we can get value out of this event. Uh, in case you guys want to send some questions or recommendations or maybe participate in the discussion, you, the chat is always open. And of course, the link that we will be sending regarding the Q&A always participate. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so I think Gabrielle is back. Uh, maybe she can start uh, sharing her screen so we can do the panel discussion. Okay, can we, can we make Gabrielle a uh, a co-host so she can share her screen okay cool awesome yeah so you can see right now a preview of what she's done now um just watch the screen as we go through the panel discussion so it will be like a collection of quotable quotes as you listen to our panelists you can also look at the art that she's going to present us awesome right yeah. so let's get into it okay 
So maybe we can we can always uh, what we can do is let's start with Dr. Marciano. But uh, Nick, feel free to always add your thoughts uh, during the panel discussion. Okay, so I'd like to uh, put this to Dr. Marciano, the question of like unknown to most, actually, the aerospace industry in the Philippines has been around for quite some time now, right? But can you tell us about a little bit for, especially for students, how has the local aerospace industry been shaped over the past few years, few years especially before the FILSA? Okay. Thanks for that question. Uh, what I know is that our aerospace industry in the Philippines is really more focused on uh, manufacturing uh, for aircraft um, civilian aircraft components. Uh, so that's a, that's a big market. And uh, rightfully so, uh, the Philippines um, um, anchoring an industry in terms of uh, servicing that global demand for airplanes, although it's not a very good time now for travel and aircraft in general, of course, but uh, it would have its ups and downs. But that has dominated the aerospace industry in the Philippines. I think in around 2014, it amounted to something like $600 million dollars and the scheme of things, it's it's really not that big a share of the pie, but it's a good start considering that a few years uh, prior to that, there was really nothing you know, um, in the Philippines. So it has um, it has um, burst into the sea, uh, burst into the scene. Um, it, it is getting continuous support from the government. So our venture into space with satellites and data downstream. You know, when they talk about data, it's really about this down, downstream segment for satellites. The utilization of these satellites opens opportunities also for industry creation. That can contribute to expanding this industry. You know, you're talking about uh, geospatial intelligence and um, you know, in the value chain for this industry, uh, we need to unlock the capability of um, groups in the Philippines um, that means um, it, government agencies and um, private companies in terms of in, in, in terms of interpreting and extracting value from from this data. So in the case of government, this data is available, but can you create actionable information out of it that you can now translate into um, more responsive and effective programs that would serve, the country, so that's um, that's that's one way you know that we can uh, build this ecosystem. So, uh, okay, so, so going back to the question on on the aerospace industry, it's it's focused on manufacturing for aircraft. We're trying to expand that as well. Yeah, cool. Um, in line with that, right? Because Nick has been mentioning about how do you determine like whether a country becomes a space superpower, and he mentioned about having a niche market, right? So given that, uh, given that concept, uh, what do you think will be the the niche that the Philippines is targeting as of the moment? And maybe Nick can also tell us about what are the common themes in the niche market that is being targeted by the Asia Pacific region, the different national space programs as well. Yeah. Okay, so maybe to answer that, that, that very good question, let me, let me try to share, if I can, uh, is it possible to share this uh, slide? Um, yeah, just sure. one slide, okay, let me sure. go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, can you see this? This is um, a report from APEC, our Asia Pacific Economic uh, Community, about the value of, um, of Earth observation, um, the satellite data products, for example, to the Philippines. Let me just point out one thing here. This is the value chain. So if in terms of a niche, um, what, what we're trying to do first, well, and at least try to uh, in, in the foreseeable future is to unlock this value chain and make it uh, more seamless. Right? So uh, there has been infrastructure as you've seen in place in terms of ground stations and some capability to build satellites, but if not building satellites, at least to uh, be conversant in the data products um, in specifying what requirements of satellite of satellites that we that we need to that we need right? and so and, and processing that data into some suitable form there is some um, emergent capability and perhaps even to some sectors some mature capability there uh, we have infrastructure and we can utilize this data um, the, the key is now being having the analytical capacity to interrogate the data and also to gain insights from this data. So, um, in, in you know, otherwise it just remains data and it, it's not translated into concrete 
uh, programs that will be that will benefit uh, the country. Uh, so in the beginning, well, for the past several years, the investments in space technology in the Philippines has really been focused on enabling our government agencies to respond to the needs of, of the country, whether it is disaster risk reduction, agriculture, fisheries, um, food security, climate change, etc. cetera. Um, that has been a big, a big focus. So I would like to say that in, in terms of enabling space and extracting benefits from space for the country, it's more inward looking. Um, uh, now, you know, looking towards the requirements of the Philippines, trying to cascade the benefits of space so that it pervades uh, different government agencies, agriculture, fisheries, national security, um, maritime domain awareness, um, of course, uh, environmental uh, protection, uh, urban planning, etc., so that they can cascade the benefits of space. So it's not PILSA directly. Um, in the beginning, cascading those benefits, but working with other government agencies to cascade those benefits to the communities because they have the mandate um, in agriculture, in fisheries and disaster risk reduction, there are government agencies that exist. So that has been the, the focus over the past decade and continues to be a focus. But at the same time, because we have this capability to build these satellites, we're also now trying to enable our local semiconductor and electronics industries uh, where it makes sense to carve a niche in terms of their market studies, uh, what components are, are, are really viable in the global supply chain, say for satellites and spacecraft that they can participate in. So it's an ongoing process, it's an ongoing dialogue. So the PILSA is of course also finding its bearings in this area. And that's why the dialogue is very important with these groups, government, other government agencies and industry groups so that we can um, work towards uh, further establishing and firming up those uh, those those plans and programs. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Maybe we can hear from Nick's side as well, like what has been going on with the common themes, probably in this line of uh, discussion. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Just to yeah. confirm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I think that comes to mind when talking about niches is there are some niches that are very uh everyone wants to participate in uh because they're exciting and they draw a lot of headlines and the quintessential one of those is uh launch services because everyone loves a picture of a rocket um <laughs> but there's a lot of niches that are not so sexy <laughs> for lack of another word but but are really important and like dr marshada was just talking about the data like there is so much data coming from satellites it's too much you know i was talking to an earth observation analyst uh yesterday or two days ago who is working through backlogs of uh sar imagery years old because there's just too much to go through so um you know that's another thing right there dr marshado i'm sure can talk about it a lot but sar imagery synthetic aperture radar as opposed to uh passive optical sensing where you're just basically taking photos you there's synthetic aperture radar where you're shooting down radar beams they bounce back and then you can get a kind of kind of like a, an image essentially but there are lots of advantages but even right there there's so much information coming in from SAR that like, this is, this is the forefront. Everyone's thinking about how can we make more SAR stuff? How can we make, we're not even able to analyze the data that's coming in. So I think an interesting niche um, and one that doesn't really require you to be in any location because you know, you can, all you need is a computer and an internet connection is uh, the data processing. Um, but I don't know, you know, in order to make a smart, you know, suggestion for like the Philippines, for example, you need to understand what is already happening there. But I think that that's a key thing is to think about the not, uh, the not headline grabbing niches and then trying to align them with what's already happening in your national space sector. Yeah. 
Good idea. G really, really good points from our panelists. Um, I actually personally agree as well. Uh, I was just like going through several works or projects on, you know, identifying entry points for emerging space economies. How do emerging space economies participate in the bigger space industry, right? And when, even though rocket launchers are really exciting, it's, uh, it's sometimes not practical for emerging space economies. So like Nick and Dr. Marciano has pointed out, it's really important to pinpoint that which is more uh, you know beneficial for the for the country as a whole i myself i'm like uh, part of a group who's uh, mobilizing a, a group of data scientists who are using a lot of satellite images that is uh, readily available from different organizations around the world and how do you how do you create value out of that so i'm really happy to hear those thoughts because i i 100% agree so yeah okay um Maybe one thing that's very interesting to hear as well is the journey of the Philippine Space Agency. Um, amongst our Asian neighbors, the lobbying, the lobbying for the FILSA has probably been the fight the fastest, right? Um, if I remember, uh, if we look at Australia, for example, I don't mean to ditch or anything, but Australia has been trying to establish the Philippines, uh, their space agency for quite some time. And then uh, comes along Philippines who, who did it for like a really, really fast pace. Uh, Time frame, and I just like to know um, uh, from Dr. Marciano, what did we do right? Why was Filsa seen as like needed by the officials? Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, well, I guess offhand, I can say it's a, it was a concerted effort. It's a team effort. It's a lot of teamwork. It's people coming together, um, probably led by the science and uh, Department of Science and Technology, and uh, you know there, there were a lot of really good people involved there. Not just the ones in the in, in the building the satellite. So let, let me say let me put it this way, you know, uh, it's we 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 can try to appeal to build a space agency, but we needed also to show um, some concrete developments that are happening on the ground that would support that. So so you know it's not like we establish a space agency one day and then figure out then what it, what is it going to do the next the next day. Um, that was already figured out at the outset. So that. Few years and the space agency was proposed even back in 2012. An initial effort in, in Congress uh, was um, there was a proposal there, but I think it gained traction also because of well, there's a tireless effort of the people promulgating it um, from the legislators and the various consultants who were involved uh, in the DOST uh, pushing it. I would name Dr. Romar Sese, who was instrumental um, in, in, um, in the DOST in, in pushing that legislation. But I'd also like to give credit to the, the team that were really on the ground doing the, 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 the ground infrastructure and the infrastructure in space. So that when we started talking about legislation in the minds of the, of the legislators, they had a more concrete idea of what the space agency was going to do. So it's that, that's that concerted effort that I was talking about in the beginning. So the people who were working on the legal policy side and the people in the, the scientists, engineers, the social scientists, uh, economists who were doing the the, sat the studies for the satellites, building the satellites, processing the data, building the ground stations, and like I said in the presentation, FILSA is new, but it's it's building from the ground up, which is actually good because it uh, allows you a chance to build the right culture into a new organization, but it's not starting from scratch at all, which is uh, important to realize because there's been that prior activity. So I think we got that right. And it, it's, it's a cool effort, you know, it, it takes, a, in the Philippines, you call it a barangay, right? It's a, it takes an entire barangay to, to, to build a space agency and to, to push, put this into, um, uh, make it concrete. So I think that's what happened. I hope I answered your question. Is that? Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that that sounds cool. Um, well, well, let me add. I guess it also helped that our Secretary of Science and Technology, in one or two media briefings, and also in one perhaps uh, meeting, a high-level meeting, mentioned that among ASEAN countries, the Philippines was kind of um, um, well needed to have a space agency because it was kind of lagging behind in terms of that that kind of uh, organization and legislation. So, it. it I think it, it uh, resonated with the other cabinet members and he got the support. The, the science secretary got the support of various other members of the president's cabinet for establishing the space agency. Uh, so he was also quite instrumental. Cool, awesome. 
it's just fascinating to hear the story, right? How do you, how did you able to convince these politicians to, you know, be on board in this one? A lot, a lot of efforts to establish a national space program has been met by political, political divisions and whatnot uh, in different parts of the world. It's really awesome that the Philippines got this kind of journey, and it's really nice. Um, maybe we can also, we would also love to hear Nick's opinion about, let's say. Um, some of the space programs that uh, that are being drafted in several parts of the world, for example, sometimes they're trying to copy from other uh, space programs, national space programs. Um, I've seen Malaysia space program. It's really good. It's really amazing. It's uh, it's really exciting. Um, but when we go to other parts of the world, let's say they might be copying a space policy from uh, the Western world, for example. Uh, what is your opinion about is is there is, is there a proper way to contextualize uh, space policy programs per region or is, there, is, is, it, is it like a good idea basically to copy uh, successful space programs from the US, for example, or from the European countries? Is that a good thing for Asian countries to do? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends. Uh, as, as is the case with any complex question, the answer is it depends, but, um, you know, different governments have different uh, traditions, different political economies have different traditions of relationships between governments and uh, markets. Um, so to go back to kind of what I was talking about in my presentation, you know, if you think about the steering and the enabling approaches, um, some countries tend to be more steering, you know, like Singapore, there's a heavy government influence in Singapore in many aspects of market activity. It would be very strange for Singapore to try and develop, if it were, to try and develop a space agency to do so in kind of a, a more enabling fashion. Um, so I think it's important to think about uh, um, what, it's a difficult concept, but kind of institutional fit, like what is the institutional tradition of a country and then making the space agency work within that sort of tradition um, or the space policy more generally. Um, I think it's another really important thing to think about like what is a good, approach uh, for space policy is uh, consistency is pretty important. Um, it's very, I think it's pretty important with, it's important in a lot of areas of policy, but especially the space sector, you're talking about multi-year plans where, you know, they only succeed if you stick with it. Uh, and otherwise you can just go back and say, hey, all those plans, what happened to them? Um, so it's important to have uh, a plan with a realistic timeline that that is stuck to and to not be kind of transitioning be oh let's try the Taiwanese way and now let's try the New Zealand way back and forth no it's got to be figuring out what fits with the institutional traditions of the country and then coming up with a plan and then kind of sticking with it does that answer the question yeah I think uh, I think uh, that's a perfect answer uh, it's just that I was about to ask, like, uh, if you look inward into the Asia Pacific region, uh, a lot of the countries are already trying to establish their own space policies or space programs. And would it be like, I mean, is it possible to answer the question, is there an Asian country that could probably be something that people would look up to? Governments would look up to itself, like a goodly crafted space policy within the Asia Pacific region, for example. I would love to hear Dr. Marshano's answer to that, but uh, you know, the obvious, this obvious stars are Japan and China now. Um, but you know, I think I think New Zealand personally is kind of a pretty interesting option uh, and you know asia pacific is incredibly diverse in terms of the you know kind of state traditions new zealand and china are totally different but they're both kind of asia pacific um so i don't know i mean i guess it depends on 
I don't know. It's a too difficult a question to answer. I don't, I think Japan has, Japan is the best, the best Asia Pacific space power, I think, in terms of having a long established tradition that is obviously, it has been here for a while and it probably will keep being here for a while. China wins in terms of the most, uh, you know, fascinating growth, uh, but will it stick? I don't know. Um, India is also really interesting. India is pretty interesting because there's been a, I don't know if that technically counts as Asia Pacific. I was looking at Wikipedia. Sometimes <laughs> India is included in, in Asia Pacific, sometimes it's not. But you know, India is pretty interesting because often it's, it also has a longstanding program. It has some very, it, it, it fills some nice niches. It has some good launch capacity. It also is very focused on providing kind of developmental assistance for people inside of India. So I don't know, uh, a successful, I guess the answer is uh, to which country has a successful model depends on what you think success is. Yeah, let, let, me, let me add to that because uh, Nick called me out there and um, um, well, for, for the Philippines, I mean, when we talk about being a space superpower, um, for me and perhaps for Filsa at this time, what that really means is, well, where does that power emanate from? It's, it's probably the ability to utilize um, or take advantage and extract benefit from space to say, grow your economy. I mean, fundamentally, it's about growing the economy. It's about how to translate um, these capabilities, infrastructure, know-how and people, very important, people to, uh, as contributors to gross domestic product. Right? How do we expand our economy? How do we enable new services? Um, and, and, and that can come in many forms. It's not necessarily in terms of uh, serving the global market by, by um, uh, flying somebody's uh, satellite through your rockets, etc. It could be through um, um, experiences and best practices in, in, util in utilizing and leveraging, mobilizing data. It could be through um, um, being a um, benevolent you know, a provider of images to a region such as to a consortium of satellites where you cooperate and share data when, when, when you monitor disasters, forest fires, uh, flooding, et cetera, and, and being contributing to the global community in, in, that, in that respect. So uh, how, how do you grow your economy through space? Um, I guess that's, that's important for every country that, that goes into this. Uh, of course, there is that element of national pride by being able to fly rockets or having many number of satellites, et cetera, and, and doing it uh, and contributing to other countries. That's also quite important, having astronauts, right? Uh, that is somewhere down the line, you know? I mean, I would not discount the impact of having astronauts in a country like the Philippines, especially if we can bring our astronauts to the uh, rural, rural elementary schools, in, in the public schools, in, in, the, in the rural places and inspire the young kids to go into science and technology or to something related to, uh, you know, in the social sciences, we study policy and the economics of, of space. So that, that's a very powerful thing, right? Um, so, but yeah, again, to grow the economy, we have to invest in the people, we have to invest in the infrastructure in the beginning. And then we have now to um, orchestrate all of that so that they can produce this output the way we're doing it is we're starting with the various government agencies that um, have these their respective mandates, whether it's agriculture, disaster response, um, because by, by enabling agriculture, by enabling better disaster response, we are, we might, we can avoid losses. We can avoid damages to property and loss of lives, and that can contribute to growing the economy. So, so that, as, uh, that is in a way, you know, what, what we are, uh, Trying to what we've been what we've been trying to do over the past uh, several years, even before Filsa is established. But with Filsa being there, now you have the the, the guy. Or you have the agency weaving the conductors, you know, baton and trying to orchestrate all of these efforts so that domestically we can be a we can be stronger, right? And uh, then and share that with the rest of the world. Um, maybe I'd like to. That made me think of one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, um, success, however you define it, is very important. Um, but it's also very important that the success is recognized and valued. <laughs> As Dr. Marshall was just indicating, it has to be something that the rest of society not only is aware of, but, you know, really values. Because if you don't have that, there goes your space program. Like that's that's why I was saying, you know, politics and economics matters and 
you know, you were talking with, you were asking Dr. Marciano about how did the agency come to be and why was it successful? You need to not only uh, succeed, but you need to make sure that everyone that matters sees that you succeeded and value that success. Um, that's like very critical. That's and just one, one, one last point, you know, that is like, everyone here is a space nerd. So probably everyone is aware of the story, but you know, that's why the space race happened was it was important that the Americans and the Soviets beat each other at various stages of the game. And then when it stopped being important, it was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> so it matters if the political economic reality, you know, the, the, the politicians and everyone else thinks that what you're doing is successful. Let me add to that insight. Um, in, in the Philippines, uh, I guess what was um, the approach was to talk about the data in the beginning, because that, that is something that's tangible that people can relate to if we can connect the data to information that can be used for better governance. So going back to the earlier question of why we were kind of successful in a short span of time to uh, put up this agency, um, well, of course, it's really just beginning. The journey is just beginning, by no means finished. In fact, more work is, um, which more challenges are up ahead, uh, especially with the establishment of the agency. But it, ha it is there now because we have, I guess, collectively managed to show that space can benefit us um, and, and it's valuable because it yields these outputs um, that we can use to prepare better and respond better to, to the typhoons, that we are facing year in, year out, um, that we can use this to more efficiently manage and monitor our agriculture and food security. So it, it's by no means finished, but you know, you, you try to win small victories uh, along the, uh, every step of the way. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's pointing that out. And then once you show the value of the data and then, okay, then can we talk about the technology behind this data? We need to understand it better. How about these cameras? How do they exactly work? Um, maybe we need to customize one. Do we have that capability? Perhaps we should invest in that capability. We do have a team now, then maybe do we need to build our own satellites? Well, in case you need, in, we need it, you know, we have people there that's, uh, that can and build these payloads, they can build these bus systems for satellites um, because we have a very specific need in our country. Um, that we need radar because we're best with clouds. Um, we probably, uh, um, you know, can customize uh, satellites uh, for our purposes, etc. So that that's something that we are always looking into. But that is the message that we're trying to convey as well. Cool. That is such a great strategy. I I I think like it's great how like the Philippines is trying to reverse engineer it from how the leading developed space powers are doing it, and we're focusing on what we have now and then what we can do more later. Um, I think well, we have well, some. Yeah, sorry, that, that's the advantage of a latecomer, isn't it? I mean, uh, you, know, you, you can um, kind of look around and see what has worked, what has not worked. So the more interesting parts of which ones have not worked, because you learn a lot more from things that have not worked and things that have worked in some, because sometimes when things work, you only see the final polished product, but things that have not worked have more interesting things to, to say about them, yeah. right? And why, so anyway, yeah, go ahead, please, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. I, I'm really glad that you are sharing that and we are learning about this because um, I think a lot of us in the Philippines, especially the youth, are very excited to know how we can get involved. And we actually had like some questions for our, our, our audience. Um, They're asking like, what when will like the Philsa potentially be opening its doors for applications uh, in terms of employment? Um, would it be directly to Philsa or would it be like through the other government agencies as well. Um, and they're also asking if there are like possible career opportunities um, in FILSA for non-engineering courses. So uh, Dr. Marchano- I'm very you... happy to answer that question. You know, I look forward to that, to that uh, opportunity as well. Well, currently we, we, are, we, do, we are hiring now, but it's hiring for the executive offices. Um, you know, it, it's a lengthy process. I, I wish I could, uh, I wouldn't want to bore you with how it's done, but it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a playbook that you have to, that you, you, you kind of uh, go by and sometimes write the chapters to this playbook as you go along in building a new agency. Um, it's a very interesting experience, especially doing so in the midst of a pandemic. Right? Um, it makes it more compelling and even actually more fulfilling to, to be building an agency because you know it's needed. You know, you know, you, know, you want to be able to serve right away. 
Um, so there's a there's you have to uh, propose to the budget department uh, these um, uh, these positions and organizational structure. We've done that. They've reviewed it, and we have positive feedback on that. And we maybe what I can just say is we expect to be hiring in the fourth quarter of this year. Well, that's that's my hope. And um, unless something else happens, but uh, yeah. So by fourth quarter of this year, we'd be posting many open positions for people who are not just scientists and engineers. I am very keen on social scientists being part of this because the message of space is not just about the technologies and science. It's really about the socioeconomic impact. It's about, it's about the use of data for econometrics, for measuring our economy, and also for presenting it to the legislators and to the other government offices. They need to understand the cost benefit um, among others. So it, it requires uh, scientists and, and engineers are not necessarily predisposed to think of those things. They're not trained. They, they can make things work. They can analyze things. But in terms of justifying a budget and, and why these things need to be done over that, you know, we are building an in-house socioeconomic team within the agency. That's quite important for a, for a space agency. Not to mention outreach, right? Um, artists, are, in terms of the data, Visualization is very important because you might have data, but it, it doesn't it doesn't convey the message. So this needs to be rendered in, in a way, and you know that that is that would resonate with people, that could be easily understood by policymakers, etc. So that that's very important as well, the outreach part. So in the organizational structure that we have proposed at Pilsa, there are units dedicated to science outreach, and we have the opportunity to have learned from various uh, space agencies and how this this can be done. Um, so outreach, uh, public communications, as well as socioeconomic impact, that's, that's very important to a space agency. So many opportunities, not just for scientists and engineers. Harley? Oh, I think Harley might be um, having some technical difficulties. Uh, so, uh, we have like another question in the field of, oh, Harley is back. Hi, Harley. So um, Hi. <laughs> so did you have any other question aside from that? Or um, are we moving on to careers in space? Yeah, we can, we can, we can start talking about that. I was just actually very happy that To this kind of activity, um, I was just thinking, uh, how do you how do you approach innovation in terms of space technology from a non-technical perspective? Like, how how does Philsa intend to go about this, or is there like a plan of you know onboarding crazy creatives, storytellers, or maybe novelists who are just coming up with crazy ideas, and maybe just discover whether their idea can be something that's technical, technologically possible and stuff like that. Maybe kids who are like, you know, um, musicians or artists, and they are space nerds, because I know a lot of creatives who are space nerds. It's just that they are into art, and they're not, they're not into the technical side of things. So what what is the current uh, scenario in terms of Filsa and how do you encourage participation from these kinds of people? Yeah. Okay, well, I guess that's all part of our outreach activities. You know, maybe whether it is inside Filsa, we have a team that's doing this in Filsa, perhaps to some extent there is, there are communicators, they are very important and uh, space needed, needs to be communicated. And that was a very important um, uh, accomplishment in, in, in terms of convincing uh, legislators to put up a space agency and the, and the president to sign it is because we, I believe we communicated that message, not just through words, but through actions, through the actual developments that have been happening with the satellites and the data. So that, that's very important. Um, but um, the outreach, uh, yeah, you know, FILSA can give grants uh, to universities. And these are not just for scientific research. It could be for uh, education and, um, and and for developing you know, new ways of, of, of um, uh, implementing space education and awareness. So that, that's uh, also part of our key development area is education, space education and awareness. So various programs can be uh, put in place to address that, not just by PILSA itself, but through a network of partners. That's how you grow the ecosystem. You have to work with the universities, you have to work with uh, industry, you have to work with these various groups and, and, and give them the capacity, enable them to contribute. 
even organizations like SGAC um, could could be. Uh, of course, I, 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 uh, we have to look into how you're organized, but I, I can imagine you partnering with various groups and the consortium and trying to apply in the future for grants from a space agency to do certain activities and to, to, to you know, to promote space education and awareness and creativity. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe we can also hear from Nick about what his thoughts are, because I, I know he's really passionate about this one. I just feel like he's really passionate about, you know, bringing non-space nerds into the fold. Um, what, what have you seen as the trend in terms of, uh, uh, engaging in that kind of initiatives for space policies are they i mean is there a growing a positive growing positive outlook in the asia pacific region in that context or do we need more do we need more engagement on that uh, side of space participation um yeah uh i i'm always a fan of having more non-space nerds involved in space activity uh i am um I don't have a background in the space sector, uh, yet I am consulting for a bunch of space sector companies. <laughs> uh, I think it's actually a benefit um, to my clients. Um, I mean, I have a background now, but when I started, I did not. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's lots of uh, ways to get involved. I think... Um, I'm sorry, wait, can you repeat the question exactly? I didn't quite, are you talking about, can you say the question again? <laughs> I was just wondering whether uh, in the Asia Pacific, is that like an ongoing trend or is that is that something mm. that they're already adopting or do you, do you think we need more uh, uh, those kinds of initiatives? We need more activities to encourage non-space nerds. Um, I don't know, I mean, you're in the Philippines. How many, how many Filipinos care about space? I think every kid out there um, cares about space. Like, I think mostly everyone grows up just like looking at the stars and wanting to go out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, then, yeah, maybe maybe the situation is good. I mean, you know, I I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if it's it's a. I, it's a difficult thing to say. There needs to be lots of non-space nerds involved in space. Um, they, the, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how to answer it. It's not a very Maybe in connection to that, um, another question that we also had was like, what skills do you think are relevant now in terms of being able to participate in space and like pursue okay. careers in space, um, even for like non-technical, non-science people, like how, how do you like get them to be inspired to pursue like their passion in space and be involved? Because that's kind of what happens in the Philippines. Like a lot of us are interested in space, but it's not really considered a practical career. And since mm. we come from a developing country, like parents would usually um, encourage your children to pursue like practical careers instead of mm. like pursuing careers in space. So most, uh, I imagine most students would just like be pursuing like other careers that are not directly in space, but then there's always a way to be involved no matter what field you currently are or, yeah. Do you have any? Um, I mean, are there, you know, Dr. Marsano would probably know better than I. I mean, are there companies, are there space companies that have a presence in the Philippines? Uh, you know, basically any business any any profession that you can think of it exists in the space sector you know are you are you an accountant you can be an accountant in the space sector are you a pr writer you can be a pr writer in the space sector you know are you a are you a business strategist are you an investment analyst you know are you a communications person are you an hr person all of these things exist in the space sector i guess that in terms of being a filipino you know it depends on how many companies or market entities like organizations potentially also exist where such you know such work options are but I would say like you know it's more a question of that you know what what organizations exist and figure out how to work with them what what uh companies are there in the Philippines Dr. Marshana well you know I mean, are there any about, like yeah. are there many foreign mm -hmm. ones well there are foreign companies but in terms of space um companies um 
Mm, no, I would say no, not, not, not probably you can count them by the fingers of one hand in terms of hardcore space, right? But there mm. is increasing interest with the establishment of PILSA um, to look at opportunities um, on, on, on the downstream, you know, with, with the, um, the ground infrastructure that we've put in place, um, the, the, the sharing of these infrastructure, the, the utilization of ground stations so that we can have access to other satellites and the distribution of data. So that, that's an opportunity. But uh, as mentioned, you know, there are other industry groups and sectors like semiconductors, electronics, machining that can participate in, in, that, global, in that global industry. Um, we just mm -hmm. need to be shown how and um, they need to know where there, where there are warm bodies in the Philippines that are available for them in case you know they, they decide to invest in, in that area. So with, with the enabling uh, policies of government to the PILSA, um, there are existing incentives already for companies to pioneer into these uh, new, new, new fields um, in terms of um, um, tax holidays, et cetera, and uh, well, other similar incentives. But the people is important. People are important. You know whether they, they do have access to um, the workforce, whether it's in mm. the upstream or downstream. So so I, I would say uh, in answer to the, the question, which was about um, careers for Filipinos in space and the concern. I guess I heard about the concern of parents. And to be honest with you, I've, I've heard that directly from a parent. You know, um, and and uh, so how do you, how do you answer that? Well. I tell them, you know, you're, you're not, we don't really produce space engineers. We, we, you can be an economist, you can be an, an electrical engineer, you can be a mechanical engineer, and you can do things in space. So, so to, to that, um, you know, in that, in that sense, you, you can uh, take a degree course in chemistry and you, know, you can apply yourself in many areas. So then you gain a specialization at some point, um, you know, whether you do that, you get that on the job training or you do a master's degree, maybe then you can focus on something like building satellites or nano satellites. Um, but, but then the training that you get in building satellites, because that's what we were doing, we explain that to people and say, you, you know, at the end of the day, the skill that you're getting here is building tough, resilient things, right? Things that work in, in a harsh environment. That's useful, that's, that's useful across many industries, many applications, not just space. If you're able to build a sensor that survives in, in microgravity or in, in harsh temperature cycling environments, then that can be applied to geothermal uh, applications. You know, it's the discipline, it's the training that you get, not necessarily the end product that you are trained to produce. So that, that's what we say. You know, it, it's kind of that mindset and the skill of people that, um, that are learned and obtained as they build satellites or as they build spacecraft or rockets, perhaps um, that can be applied across different industries. It's a systems thing. I mean, you know, building something that is larger than the sum of its parts and how do you make sure that the parts work, right? You might as well be building um, a, a vehicle, a, a car or a boat or a ship and the same thing applies, right? So that it has to work in a harsh environment. The pieces have to come together and work together. You might be an electrical engineer, but you need to talk to the mechanical engineer because they're, your, his work and your work, they need to come together and work seamlessly. Um, so that's, that's really what these satellites and building these spacecraft is about. Um, you know, it, it's that skill. Cool. There's one other thing I was thinking of while you're talking is, you know, there's a way to get involved in the space sector, which is, I mean, I don't know the Philippines, so I'm just kind of speculating here, but surely Filipinos use apps of some sort that have some basis in space technology, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. Certainly, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, so there mm -hmm. are ways to be involved in the space sector that is not about, you know, shooting stuff up and maintaining and building things that are floating around, you know, are in orbit around Earth. Like you are involved in the space sector if you're somehow using data from space to help people. Yeah. Um, that would be so space I don't enabled. Know, like, yeah, yeah. Space yeah, enabled services, know, so, right? I mean, the downstream. Yeah, space enabled yeah. services. Um, what would be some of the, you know, like, I don't know, like in New Zealand, you know, like obviously things like Google Earth, like yeah. that is obviously a space enabled app that everyone is addicted to. Yeah. You know, there surely must be things like that in 
the Philippines that have some business presence as well in the Philippines that are maybe specifically apps that are like designed for Filipinos by Filipinos. Yeah. You know, and if you're working in with such a company, then, you know, you are in the space sector, despite not actually, you know, making the thing that is providing the data or sending it up there. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. Like, say, for example, we've got like, if you are, if you are addicted to online shopping, for example, those, you know, logistics facilities, those logistics services, they are hardcore users of uh, uh, satellites as well. So there's a lot of commercial applications that people just don't realize that they're heavily using space. Um, so yeah, actually, I'm really, really happy about this discussion. Uh, there's a lot of insights that, that's been thrown around, but unfortunately, time has caught up with us. So I have a lot of questions as well personally, but I think we have to give time to the audience as well. So what we can do next is let's entertain some questions from the audience. If they've sent their questions through the link that we have, then maybe we can, we can feature them on the screen as well for the panelists to see. Are we or are we presenting the artworks after then after the Q and A? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. The, our artists can proceed like uh, converting the quotable quotes from our awesome panelists, and then yeah. we can. Look and then we can. At the art okay, great. Thank you. So we are going to be the session for the Q and A. So yeah. Cool. Yeah, we are going to be featuring some questions. Um, yeah. Some of them have been actually asked already, so we're just gonna. Um, feature a few ones that haven't been asked yet exactly. So one that we have right now is, uh, will FILSA lead or support the addition of more astronomy and aerospace degrees in large universities? Um, it was sent anonymously. So whoever asked this question, if you're around, uh, please feel free to also um, open your mic or uh, video. Um, do I, do I answer that question now or do I wait? Yeah, I, you can answer the question. Okay. Um, well, I guess that, that, that decision is really up to the universities in terms of their, their plans. But we, you know, it, certainly in, in the country, um, there are um, opportunities to enhance our environmental science and meteorology. Um, so those, those things are quite relevant in a country where we're uh, the Philippines, where we're situated geographically, right? So that that will we'll, that is that is something that needs to be worked uh, together with. We have to work together with the, the um, tertiary education uh, groups, uh, Commission on Higher Education, um, that are that are um, proposing or regulating the, uh, the, the that curriculum in in the in the schools. So you can expect some dialogue in that area. Yes. And by the way, I should add. That uh, astron it's a peculiar thing about astronomy in the Philippines, in the, in the context of the Philippine Space Act. Um, I think the original intent is for the FILSA also to uh, take over entirely astronomy. But you know, the other government agency called PAGASA, that is the Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical Astronomical Services Administration, um, retains astronomy. They do have a space weather group. So that's not a problem, you know. It's it's um, it, that only means that Pilsa and Pagasa need to work together um, mm -hmm. to 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 further expand, you know, um, our our capabilities or our education in in astronomy, whether it's to observatories or um, science outreach, etc. So I look forward to that, and that that's something we will work with the weather. Pagasa, by the way, Nick is the weather bureau in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They're they're the weather bureau, and that's their long name. And one of the A's there is as astronomy. Uh -huh. so, so it's uh, two groups coming together, and um, I think it, it can work, certainly. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Doc Marciano. Uh, we have another question as well that might also be interesting for... Um, wait, I am just trying to find out where the question mm. is. Uh, that might also be interesting for Nick to answer. So it the, someone asked and it's anonymous again so whoever asks this question feel free to like come up <laughs> um someone asked did filsa or the government consider creating an asean space agency just like uh esa the european space agency with like other um southeast asian countries um and like nick do you think it's 
um, feasible or good for the Asia Pacific to have some sort of like regional uh, space agency like uh, ESA? Um, anyone who'd like to answer this? <laughs> Want to give it a go, Nick? Dr. Martin. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you can speak more about uh, the potential for an ASEAN space agency. <laughs> well, I can say that um, there were some, um, not, not a concrete proposal, there were some back room discussions about an ASEAN space agency through the Committee on Science and Technology of the ASEAN. Um, I think then, you know, it, 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 perhaps it was too um, early in the day, maybe it was a head, an idea that was ahead of its time. But uh, I guess whether it's an ASEAN space agency um, or not, I guess really the spirit here is cooperation across space agencies. And th that's already a platform for that through the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, and let me also say that, you know, to some limited extent, this is already in place uh, through a consortium. Um, we have an Asian microsatellite consortium wherein, um, you know, Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Mongolia, well, Mongolia is not part of ASEAN, but still, you know, and together with Japan, uh, the microsatellites that we launch are meant to form a constellation and a consortium wherein we can share these assets. Uh, so, so then um, as a prelude to uh, formally establishing this that umbrella of a, an ASEAN or a regional space agency, uh, maybe to help justify that. Um, there are these things that are happening on the ground. So I think that's important. Similar to what happened with Pilsa, there needs to be some activity on the ground, you know, this flurry of activity that, that people need to see, that the legislators need to see that there are people involved, there are programs in place. And so the space agency will just institutionalize and operationalize that further. And, and make sure it's sustained and even enhanced. So I think it's it's good to start with with these um, you know concrete efforts and try to score victories that way, and then build up the case where, where it makes sense to have this regional formal uh, space agency. I would not discount it, um, but you know it, it's something that can be discussed. But uh, we probably should focus on those things that would would um, that it would start working on in terms of sustaining. What are these activities? We have to have that cooperation in place in the beginning. Yeah. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add from that? Uh, um, just that this reminds me of a question someone asked me recently about a joint space agency between Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and oh. what the likelihood <laughs> was of that. Ooh. And I was just, you know, it seems like the most important thing is to have the national space agencies have capabilities and then think about a multilateral one. I think there's a reason the ESA is the only functionally, you know, the only functional multilateral space agency. So, I, you know, could happen someday, but probably <laughs> best to focus on national capacity first. Thank you. I think also one idea that has been passed around when, re when, when we talk about the regional space agencies, that what's unique about the ASEAN region is that they share the same uh, social problems like natural disasters, uh, like uh, demographic problems and whatnot. So like Dr. Marciano has said, the, the idea of utilizing a, a constellation of satellites that's solving the same thing, but shared among the ASEAN countries is really a, a thing that they can build upon. So yeah, that's really, that's really nice. Maybe we that, can yeah. look at the next question. Yeah, that is a great point, um, Harley. Yeah, and there's another question too. So um, someone asked anonymously again, if whether Philsa is planning to execute manned missions to the ISS um, or um, execute deep space exploration, uh, how about robotics engineering and avionics or launching rovers in the near future? So um, I mm -hmm. think Doc Marciano could Well, probably... manned mission to the ISS, not at this time. Um, although we're aware of the opportunities, uh, we're studying those opportunities and uh, in due course, that's something that we can look at. And we want, of course, our Filipinos who go into space to do something meaningful and contribute. So that requires a lot of planning, not to mention resources. So, but, but that's something that is, that of course, any space agency would, would look at, but at this time, uh, our focus really, you know, our satellites with our cameras are really trained down on earth and looking at our country and our manifold requirements for uh, for the environment and for food security and disaster response, et cetera. So that, that's the initial focus because we need to build up this agency 
um, to score those victories. And then, you know, that, that's something that, we, that we will empower the agency and empower the country, grow the economy. Um, and then at some point, you know, we can, we can um, uh, contribute to that, that uh, important effort of um, um, human activity in space. Um, robot, robotics, engineering, avionics, I think that, that, that is something that we are taking advantage, we're taking advantage of this, this already latent capability. Um, I wouldn't say it's latent, it's actually there. You know, there, there. There are groups, both on the hardware and software components of robotics. It's not just, it's not just uh, built for space. They're not building rovers for, for space, etc. but they are building these uh, robotics for bomb disposal and for, um, you know, uh, geothermal uh, and, and mining, etc. So, so there, there's already this community that, that's engaged there. And in, in Pilsa, we have um, in our plan, there is a group that's focused on uh, robotics and um, these um, uh, systems uh, for that could lead to um, these rovers. So that, that's something because we're looking at because there is capability and there's a lot of interest in terms of software and hardware for robotics through electronics programs and mechanical engineering programs. So it's, you don't need to invent a new course to start doing these things. They're there. You know, people who study mechanical engineering, electronics and electrical, they're there. In computer science, they can do that. Right. So plans to launch rovers in the future, why not? We, we do that again by cooperating with other agencies. Again, the mission planning for this, we, we need to consider uh, the mission. It, it's not just whether you have a capability to do so or you just wake up one day and say, Let, let's do that because it's cool. But we, we want to contribute to the global, uh, the knowledge of humankind in terms of understanding our solar system and, and, and cascading those benefits to humankind. So it has to, we have to plan that mission. We have to understand um, what is it that we're contributing and what we're after in terms of the, the mission objectives. Thank you, Dr. Marciano. Sure. Um, we have uh, one last quick question that you can probably answer. Um, we're just highlighting it because um, some of our audience might be interested in, in knowing whether the data sets obtained by the satellites, um, will they be open for public use soon or if they are not yet, or are they public, where can they access them? Okay, our, the data from our satellites, uh, the ones we built, Diwata 1, Diwata 2, and, and uh, are, are available to the public for free to anyone in the Philippines for free. So to do that, you send an email to the Stamina for Space program. Um, I will I will send you the. It's basically uh, info at Stamina number four space. Uh, mm. Well, it's kind of a long email address. I, I'll send it to the SJC, and you can send it to your. Um, or maybe I can type it here okay. in, in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll do that uh, later. So okay, that's all so, being shared through a portal. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so we can we can access that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, Doc Marciano is probably sharing the info for stamina uh, info at stamina for space um, email. Uh, we're just we're, so this is actually the end of our webinar, and we're just gonna have our artists share the artworks before we have our photo opportunity. So. Um. Uh, let's ask for Gabriel to share her screen again and we can all see her amazing work. It's so six o'clock. So she's been compiling, <laughs> yeah, time again. So she's been compiling the quotable quotes from the panel discussion. And yeah, let's all view it and maybe we can share it as well later for everyone to share on social media. Cool. So as she's as she's sharing her screen, maybe we can also what we can also do is allow the participants to open their cameras and uh, join us for a photo op after featuring all the awesome uh, slides for the can or the canvas from our artist. So yeah, by the way, our artist's name is Gabriel. She's a, uh, she's an Indonesian friend. So we are we are joined from Indonesia. Uh, so yeah, let's thank her for that. She has a very awesome work. Yeah. Yeah. So. Awesome. Looks good. <laughs> we will. I, I love this like last one, <laughs> like the <laughs> Philippine flag on the moon. It's like. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think we can ask everyone to just quickly turn on their cameras so we can have a quick photo 
uh, with everyone along with our guest speakers. Um, so we can then end our session. So I think we have like everyone on. Oh, cool. Okay. So, um, yeah. Oh, wow. I've, there's still more people turning on their cameras. We'll wait for them. Um, yeah. Good to see everyone. Actually, oh, I see some familiar faces too. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah, Don't so be just shy. please turn on your um, cameras. Yeah, we still have people turning on their cameras, so. Cool. Maybe I can start taking screenshots. So yeah, I'll just you can count definitely. One, two, three. Everyone just keep smiling because you don't know if you are being taken already or not. <laughs> okay, yeah. so one, two, three. Next batch. One, two, three. Next batch. Wait, last one. One, two, three. Awesome. Cool. There's a lot of participants today. I hope you guys were able to get a lot of insights from our panelists. They were really insightful about Asia and the Philippines in terms of the space industry. Um, I think what we can do now, Florence, is can we share the last slide that contains mm -hmm. the QR code that everyone yep, can? Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah. Uh, so we just want to like quickly thank everyone for coming. Um, and we have the QR code again, and as well as the link where you can uh, send us an email or um, connect with us at SG Philippines. Uh, and I believe Dr. Marciano has also shared the email for Stamina, uh, where you can access data sets. So once again, um, thank everyone for coming. We thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Marciano and Nick. Thank you very much for uh, uh, giving us and giving us your time and sharing us such valuable information and um, a lot of resources that we learned for today's webinar. We're Welcome. looking forward yeah. to our final discussions with you. <laughs> we are yeah, planning a lot of and definitely it's more. just a start. <laughs> this is just a start. <laughs> Thanks very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so for people uh, also in the audience who want to have like a quick discussion with us, you can also stay if you want. If you have like a uh, something that you'd like to propose or tell us, you can, yeah. Let's have like a sort of a networking event after this one. If our panelists can also, can also stay, they can, but if they have uh, appointments right after this one, we just like to thank you for the valuable insights that we've heard today. We, I took down a lot of notes actually. So <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop the live stream now, but everyone, um, you can stay if you want to.